I should like to call your attention this morning to the words which are to be found in Paul's first epistle to Timothy in the first chapter and the 16th verse. The 16th verse in the first chapter of Paul's first epistle to Timothy. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I call your attention to those words in order that by means of them and through them we may continue our study of this condition which we have described as spiritual depression and which we've been looking at for a number of Sunday mornings in terms of the fundamental text, in a sense, in this respect, uh, namely that statement in the 42nd Psalm, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Now, we are considering this condition not merely because it's a very sad and a very pathetic thing that any Christian should be in this condition, but still more because, in view of the times in which we are living, it behoves each one of us who claims the name of Christ to, to represent him in such a way that others will be attracted to him and not be repelled from him as they look at us and observe our life and our walk. So we are examining this uh, entire condition, and we have found already, I think you'll agree, that uh, it is a condition which can uh, attack us in many different ways, along many different lines, and can show and manifest itself in many different ways. Indeed, my problem, personally, as we are considering this subject, is the problem of classification. Not that ultimately, of course, classification matters, but it is a good thing for one's mind and one's thinking to be orderly. And the classification that I'm adopting loosely and generally is something like this. There are, first of all, uh, certain general causes or general, preliminary, fundamental causes of this condition. And we are still in the realm of those. We begin by considering, you remember, the failure to understand truly the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, that's a preliminary thing. There are many Christians, as we saw, who are confused and unhappy, who've never known real joy, because they've not been clear about that. I believe, uh, as I said, that they are justified by faith, but because their understanding isn't clear, they've never really enjoyed their salvation. And then we consider those others who uh, seem to be in that strange condition in which they see and yet don't see never knowing quite whether they're Christian or not, a state of confusion, a blurred vision, a lack of clarity in general. And uh, then you remember that uh, we also went on last Sunday morning to consider those who are uh, unhappy and never really enjoying their Christian life because of the failure to maintain the balance as between mind and heart and will the kind of thing to which, again, reference is made in this first chapter of the first epistle of Timothy. Paul speaks of those who are holding, uh, that we must hold faith and have a good conscience, which some, uh, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Hymenaeus and Alexander, because they had not paid attention to the will and to the conscience and to the living of the Christian life, and were just talking about their faith, they made shipwreck, and Paul has delivered them unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. That lack of balance, I have no doubt, is one of the great causes of uh, not only unhappiness, but of failure and of stumbling in the Christian life. Now, I say that there are some who are amazed at all this. There is a glib and superficial view of the Christian uh, which seems to think that as long as a person has signed a decision card, that that's the end, and that now they're Christians and are going to be perfectly happy. But of course that isn't the case. Experience, the history of the church, uh, shows very clearly that that is far from being the case. And uh, therefore, if we have adopted that superficial view, we are destined eventually uh, to some kind of trouble ourselves. The fact is that there are Christian people, those who are truly Christian, 
who are in difficulties for various reasons. And it is in order to help them particularly that we are concerned about this matter. Now, you can't read these New Testament epistles without seeing the truth of what I've just been saying. If simply to believe and to accept salvation is everything, well then these New Testament epistles would never have been needed. In a sense, you wouldn't need the church at all. People would just thus be saved and they'd go on happily for the rest of their lives as Christian. But here, I say, is abundant evidence that that isn't the case. These people that believe, they become Christians, and yet it's necessary for the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and others to write letters to them. Why? Well, they were in trouble in various ways. They were unhappy for various reasons. They were not enjoying their Christian life. Some of them were even tempted to look back at the life out of which they'd been saved. Therefore, I say that the very existence of the New Testament epistle shows us that this is a condition which afflicts Christian people. And uh, therefore, uh, this is a strange kind of comfort, which is nevertheless very rare. If anyone this morning listening to my words is in trouble, let me at any rate say that to you. The fact that you're in trouble is no indication that you're not a Christian. Indeed, I would almost dare to go further and say this, that if you've never had a problem in your Christian life, I should very much doubt whether it's Christian at all. There is such a thing as a false peace. There is such a thing as believing a delusion. The whole New Testament, I say, and the history of the church throughout the centuries bears very eloquent testimony to the fact that this is the fight of faith and that not to have any troubles in your soul is far from being a good sign, a very serious sign, that there is something radically wrong. And, of course, there is a very good reason for that. The moment we become Christian, we become very special objects of the attention of the devil. As he besieged and attacked our Lord, he does the same to all our Lord's people. Count it all joy, therefore, says James, my brethren, when he fall into diverse temptations or trials. That's the way that your faith is proved. Not only is your faith tested, but in a sense it's a proof that you have faith. It is because... We belong to him that the devil will do his utmost to disturb us and to upset us. He cannot rob us of our salvation, thank God. But while he cannot rob us of our salvation, he can make us miserable. He can put his limits in an external sense upon our enjoyment of the faith. And that is precisely what he does. And that is why we have all this teaching and instruction in these New Testament epistles. Well, now then, I want to consider one very common way in which the devil does that. And it is the one suggested not only by this particular verse in this first chapter of Paul's first epistle to Timothy, but indeed by the entire chapter, and especially in this autobiographical section in which the apostle refers to himself as a minister of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is the problem? Well, it's this. It's the case of those who are miserable Christians or suffering from spiritual depression because of their past. Because of their past. Some particular sin in their past. Or the particular form which sin happened to take in their case. Now, I would say that in my experience in the ministry extending now over some 27 years, there is nothing commoner than that. I imagine that I've had to deal with people more over this particular thing than anything else. It's constantly reappearing. Now, at first sight again, some of you may wonder and query whether such people are Christians at all. But you're quite wrong. They are Christians. You ask them to state the Christian faith and they can state it perfectly. They seem to be quite clear in a sense about the doctrine of justification by faith. I mean by that, that at any rate they see very clearly that they can never put themselves right. They're not relying upon their own lives or their own activities or anything that they can ever do. They're fully aware of their complete helplessness and their entire dependence upon the grace of God in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
They're quite clear about it. They can testify to that, and they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you say, what's the matter with them? Well, their condition is this. Though they seem to be quite clear about that, and though I say they can speak as Christians, they nevertheless are unhappy. And they're unhappy about something in their own past life. It isn't always the same thing, I find. Uh, but uh, they, they, they always talk about this, and they, they come to you, and uh, they look unhappy, they, they look miserable, and uh, they're always talking about this thing. They, they'll always bring it out and tell you about it. Sometimes it's some action, some deed, something which they literally did, which has involved other people, perhaps, or not, it doesn't matter, but something they did, uh, generally some one thing, some big thing, and that's the thing they constantly go back to it and hop upon it. They can't seem to leave it. They're always analyzing themselves and uh, scrutinizing themselves and condemning themselves because of it. And the result is that they're unhappy. But sometimes it's uh, something that they've said. Some word that they once spoke. Let me give you what was the most graphic and dramatic illustration of this that I've ever come across in my own experience, and I mention it simply to illustrate the point I'm making. I remember an old man who was converted and became a Christian at the age of 77. One of the most striking conversions I've ever been privileged to know. That man had lived a very evil life. There was scarcely anything which he hadn't done at some time or another. But he came into the sound of the gospel, and he was converted. And the great day came, he was received into the membership of the church, and he came to the first communion service on a Sunday night. And it was to him the biggest thing that had ever happened to him. His joy was indescribable. And we were all so happy about him. But the sequel, this was the sequel. The next morning, the Monday morning, even before I'd got up, that poor old man had shuffled down to my house. And there he was, looking a picture of utter misery and dejection, and weeping uncontrollably. And I was amazed and astounded at this, especially coming after the previous night, the greatest night of his life, the climax of everything that had happened to him. And on inquiry, when I'd eventually succeeded in pacifying him and in controlling him in a physical sense, I asked him what was the matter, what was the trouble. And the trouble was this. After going home from that communion service, he'd suddenly remembered that 30 years before, he was with a group of men in a public house, arguing about religion. And he had said with contempt and derision that Jesus Christ was a and it had all come back to him and there was no forgiveness for that this one thing ah oh, yes he was quite happy about the drunkenness and the gambling and the immorality that was all right that was forgiven he understood that clearly there was no problem there but this thing that he'd said about the very son of God the savior of the world that and there he was I say he couldn't be consoled. He couldn't be comforted. This one thing that cast him down and there he was. The kind of thing I'm referring to. Something a man has said. And it haunts him and comes back to him. And it makes him miserable and wretched. Though he still subscribes to the full Christian faith. So this condition which appears to be contradictory is a reality. And we must recognize it as such. In other cases, it's something perhaps that they have promised or had pledged themselves to. Well, I've met innumerable instances of this again. People who during an illness or something had made a certain pledge or promise to God that if, he, if they only got well, if he only healed them, they'd do so and so. And they hadn't done it. Indeed, they'd done something else which made the doing of that thing they'd promised impossible. And there they are held in the grip of this. That this makes it all impossible for them. They see the faith and subscribe to it. But this thing, this one thing. Well now, that's the kind of condition to which I'm calling your attention this morning. These are the people, in other words, 
was seem to be quite clear about all this great doctrine of salvation, except that they feel that in their case there is something different. Their sin, this particular sin, or the form that sin has taken in their case, somehow or another puts them into a special category. They say, yes, I know, but, but, and there they are, they're held down, they're miserable Christians. They are suffering from this condition of spiritual depression. Now, what's the, what is the real trouble with them? Well, uh, there are two main explanations of this condition. I'm not staying with this this morning because I'm more interested in the cure. But the two causes are perfectly clear. First and foremost, of course, it is the devil. It's just Satan, who, as I said just now, cannot rob us of our salvation, but can most definitely rob us of our joy. His great concern is to prevent anybody becoming a Christian. And, but when he fails at that, then his one object is to make them miserable Christians, or unworthy Christians, or dejected Christians, so that he'll be able to point to men who are under conviction of sin and say, do you want to be like that? That's Christianity. Look at him. Look at her. There is the picture of a Christian, miserable. Do you want to be that? Obviously, it is the one thing that he's concerned about. So, the essential cause, as with most of these uh, several conditions, is the devil himself. But here, there is also a subsidiary cause. And this is the thing I want to emphasize this morning. The important subsidiary cause here, and the one that, again, the devil obviously employs, is that this condition is almost entirely due to an ignorance of doctrine. An ignorance of doctrine. Failure to understand the New Testament doctrine of salvation clearly. That's the thing to which I now want to advert. Because this is the very essence of the treatment of this condition. Now, let me put this bluntly and plainly in order that I may emphasize it, even at the risk of being misunderstood. There is a sense in which the one thing that these people who are in this condition must not do is to pray to be delivered from it. That's what they always do, of course, and that's what they've always been doing when they come seeking help and advice. They've just been praying to be delivered from this. Here is one of those points at which the Christian, in a sense, must stop praying and begin thinking. Now, I shall be reported probably as saying that I don't believe in prayer. But um, I put it like that. The Christian must always pray. The Christian must pray without ceasing. But there are particular problems in the Christian life when I say if you just continue to pray, you will never solve them. You stop praying because your prayer is in a sense an avoidance of the problem. You stop praying and you think and you work out your doctrine, and that's the only thing to do with this condition. Now let's see how it's to be done. What are they to think of? Well, the first thing I would suggest to them is this, that they should think of the case of Paul. That's what he says here, isn't it? I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern or a model, if you like, to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now I think this is wonderful. You notice what the apostle says. What he claims here is that in a sense the Lord Jesus Christ saved him in order to set up a model. A model in what respect? Well, a model for these very people who feel that their particular sin somehow or another puts a limit upon the grace and the mercy of God. The apostle's argument is this, that his one case alone is sufficient proof once and forever that we must never reason along that line. 
In other words, here are people who believe that sins, sins can be graded. Oh yes, they say there are certain sins, I understand that perfectly all right. But this, they draw a distinction, they grade sins, they classify them. Some are forgivable, some apparently are not, and so on. Now the apostle says that uh, he and his own case is more than sufficient to deal with that type of argument. He says, whatever you may have been, whatever you may have done, whatever your particular sin is, think of me, think of what I was, a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. Could anything be worse? He hated the very name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He did his utmost to exterminate his followers. He massacred them. He went down to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and Christ to him in that condition was a blasphemy. There it is. Now, says the apostle, I'm a sort of model. I'm a test case, if you like. And whatever you are, put yourself up against me and then see where you stand. That's the first thing you do. You just think of all that. And you say, well, if he obtained mercy, if he could be forgiven, well, I must begin to think again about this sin that's in my life or this thing that's troubling. That's the first argument. But you notice the apostle doesn't stop there and we mustn't stop there. Because, uh, in a sense, uh, we must not differentiate between sin and sin. On the surface, the apostle seems to be doing that, doesn't he? He says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. As if to say, well, now there are big sinners and lesser sinners and small sinners. But he didn't say that. He didn't mean that. He couldn't possibly mean that it would be contradicting his essential doctrine. He does mean this. He does mean that, in a sense, the nearer a man gets to God, the greater he sees his sin. There is a sense in which every man should say of himself, if he's a true Christian, I am the chief of sinners. It is when a man sees the blackness and the plague of his own soul that he says, I am the chief of sinners. Nobody could be worse than this. It's only a Christian who can say that. The man of the world will never say it. He's always on the defensive and always proving what a good man he is. But the Christian sees and realizes his sinfulness. In a sense, he means that. But I think he means something more than that, as I've just been saying. He does seem to suggest that in one way, these sins against the person of Christ are the sin of sin. In other words, he puts it like this. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But by putting it like that, of course, he demolishes these gradations in sin. He looked at from one angle, his sin was the worst sin conceivable. But from another angle, it's the same as all sins. Because there's only one sin, finally, and that's unbelief. Now, that's the great New Testament doctrine at this point. And it is the thing that these people have to grasp above everything else. That we mustn't think in terms of particular sins, but always in terms of our relationship to God. How do we all tend to go astray at that point? That is why we tend to think that some conversions are more remarkable than other conversions, but they're not. All conversions are exactly the same. But we put up people to speak with their dramatic, unusual conversion. My dear friend, it takes as much the grace of God to save the most respectable person in the world as it does to save the vilest person in the world. It was the same grace of God that saved Paul, the blasphemer and the persecutor and the injurious, as the mildest, politest, quietest Pharisee that has ever been saved. Nothing but the grace of God can save anybody, and it takes the same grace to save all. But you see, we don't think like that, do we? No, you see, we think some conversions are more striking and remarkable than others, so we parade them, we put them in the front window of the shop, as it were. Why? Well, because we are wrong in our doctrine, my friends. We differentiate between sin and sin. We think some sins are more heinous than others, but they're not. All sin is the same. It all comes back to relationship to God. It's all a matter of unbelief. Now, there are many striking examples of this in the scripture. The point at which a man like Joseph showed his spiritual insight and understanding supremely, I think, was this. When tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said... How then can I do this great wickedness and 
sin against God. What troubled Joseph was not merely the act itself, not merely the wrongness to Potiphar, but if I do this, he said, I'll be sinning against God. Now that's true spiritual thinking. You see, he didn't merely think of the thing itself, not merely the act, not merely the sin. That's what we tend to do. What made sin sin to Joseph was that it involved his relationship to God. If I do that, I'll be sinning against God. David saw the same thing, of course. The murderer and the adulterer that he was. This is what topples him. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He wasn't minimizing the wrong he'd done to others. He knew all about it. But that isn't the terrible thing. It isn't the act in and of itself. It's my relationship to God. It's my rebellion against God. That's sin. And the moment you begin to think of it like that, you forget particular sins. You forget that one seems to be worse than another. No, no. It was my unbelief, says Paul. That was the time. Not the particular action. Very well, then, I say we can put it like this, that it is indeed our relationship to the law that matters. And you know the New Testament has some very striking teaching about this. I wonder whether you ever observed the list that Paul gives in the fifth chapter of the epistle to the Galatians when he talks about the works of the flesh. It's most interesting. Listen, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, Thornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Yes, we're all clear about them. Horrible. Idolatry, certain. Witchcraft, obviously. Ah, but suddenly, hatred, hatred. But I thought that sin only applied to certain people who were adulterers and unclean and perverts and so on. Not at all hatred. Variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. You notice how he mixes them up. Envyings, envyings, murders. Yes, not only actually, but in mind and in heart. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. What a list. And our Lord had said the same thing when he reminded us that it is out of the heart that come evil thoughts. And next, murders. He puts them together, you see. Not only certain big sins, but every sin, any sin, anything that's suggestive of a wrong relationship to God, a lawlessness, a breaking of the law. Well, James, again, has put this once and for all in his epistle in the second chapter and in the tenth verse, where he puts it like this. Whosoever, says James, shall keep the whole law And yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, you see, we're all on the same level. And if ever you begin to think, or the devil gets you to think that your sin is different, reply to him. It doesn't matter, say, what a man breaks uh, in respect of the law. If a man breaks in one point, he is guilty of all. And that's one point, I'm guilty of all. The law shows everybody else. So that doesn't matter, it's the law that matters. That's God's way of looking at sin, my friend, so don't let the devil mislead you and delude you. It is law, our relationship to the law of God, our relationship to the person, to God himself. That's the thing that matters. Oh, let us cease to think in terms of particular sins, because if we do, we'll fall into one of two groups. We will say, because we've not been guilty of certain sins, we're all right and we've never been sinners at all. Or else we'll say, ah, I did that particular thing and surely that must make a difference. Stop thinking in terms of sins. Consider your relationship to God. I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Very well. That's the second argument. But let's go on to a third argument. The trouble with these people, in a sense, is that they don't believe the Scriptures. You hadn't thought of that, had you, my friend? You were saying, oh, of course, the thing that's wrong about me is that terrible sin I committed. Let me tell you this morning in the name of God that that is not your trouble. Your trouble is that you're guilty of the sin of unbelief. You don't believe the word of God. Now, you may feel that you're humble, perhaps, because you're troubled about that sin. You're not. It's mock modesty. You're you're ignorant of the scripture. You don't believe what God tells you. I'm referring, of course, to the first epistle of John and the first chapter. Where we read this, 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a categorical statement made by God through his servant by the Holy Spirit. There is no limit to it. There is no qualification to it. There is no differentiation between sin and sin. I can't see any qualification at all. Whatever your sin is, if any man sin, it's as wide as that. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what it was. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you don't believe that, and if you go on dwelling on that sin, you don't believe it. I say you're not accepting the word of God. And that's your sin. You're not taking God at his word. You don't believe him when he tells you. Or what I always say to these people, I put in this form. Do you remember what happened to Peter once? Peter had gone up to the top of a house to rest. And there he suddenly went into a trance. And he saw a great sheet coming down from heaven with all sorts of four-footed beasts and animals and insects and so on in it. And a voice said to him, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter replied, saying that he couldn't do this, that nothing common or unclean had ever passed his lips. But the thing happened three times. Rise, Peter, slay and eat. No, my Lord, for nothing common or unclean have I eaten at any time. And do you remember what happened to him? The voice of God from heaven came to him again and said, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Do you realize what you're doing, said the voice of God to him? You're punctilious, you're standing on the law, nothing common or unclean. But I've commanded you to rise, to slay, and to eat. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And that is what I would say at this moment to anybody who may have been held in oppression and depression by the devil for a number of years over some particular sin in your past life. I don't care what it is nor what form it's taken. What I say to you in the name of God is this. What God hath cleansed by the blood of his only begotten Son, call not thou common or unclean. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin and all unrighteousness. Believe the word of God, my friend. Don't pray frantically to be delivered from this thing. Believe God's word. Don't ask him for a message. He's given it you. Believe it. Your prayer is a mockery at that point. But let's go on. The next uh, trouble I would indicate about these people is that they don't seem to realize fully what our Lord really did on the cross on Calvary's hill. Oh yes, they believe in his sacrificial atoning death, but they don't work it out. They don't think it out. They haven't fully grasped the doctrine. They've got enough to save them. Let's be clear about that. I'm speaking about Christians. Yes, but they're depressed because they don't realize what it is, and it's this. The angel announced at the very beginning that he should save his people from their sins. I don't see in brackets after that all sins except this one sin that you've committed. He shall save his people from their sin. Or oh, listen to Peter saying it. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. There is no qualification. There is no limit. Or indeed listen to the words of the Apostle Paul when he says that he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. They were all put there. Every one, there is no limit. There's nothing left. All the sins of his people are there. Every one of them. Indeed, he said it himself, didn't he? On the cross, he said, it is finished. Absolutely finished. In what sense is it finished? In this sense. That not only all the sins committed in the past were dealt with there, 
all the sins that would ever be committed were also dealt with there. It is one sacrifice, once and forever. He'll never have to go back to the cross again. He did it all there. All the sins were dealt with there, finally, completely, everything. Nothing was left undone. It is finished. And what we remind one another of as we take the bread and the wine is that completed and finished work. There is nothing left undone. There is no query or qualification about particular sins. All sins of those who believe on him, he has died for and has borne their punishment. Every one of them has been dealt with and God has blotted them out as a thick cloud. Sins you may ever forgive, ever commit have already been dealt with there. So when you go to him, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to cleanse you. So I go on to the next step, which is this. That we really must be clear about justification, my friends. I've dealt with this in a sense. I'm simply reminding you of it in this way. Let us remember that our justification means not only that our sins are forgiven, but that we have been declared to be righteous by God himself. Not merely righteous at that moment when we believed, but permanently righteous. For justification means this that we are given by God the positive righteousness of his own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what justification means. It doesn't merely mean that God says your sins are forgiven. No, no. He clothes us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He says you are righteous. I see you not as a sinner, but as a righteous child of mine own. I see you in Christ, covered by his holiness and righteousness. And when God does that to us, he does it once and forever. You are hidden. You stand in the righteousness of Christ before God. And I say it with reverence and the authority of his word, God sees your sins no more. He sees the righteousness of Christ upon you. Lay hold of that. The last thing I mention is this. It all comes to this ultimately, doesn't it, that it's a failure to realize our union with Christ. I told you at the beginning the trouble was ignorance of doctrine. People seem to think that Christianity just means being told that your sins are forgiven. My dear friends, that's only the mere beginning. That's merely the first step. What's it mean essentially? Well, essentially salvation means union with Christ. One with Christ. As we were one with Adam... We are now one with Christ. Crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I have been, I was, it has happened. All that's happened to him has happened to me. I am in him, I'm one with him. Read the sixth chapter of the epistle to the Romans again. I have been crucified with Christ. I have died with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. I have risen with Christ. I am seated in the heavenly places in Christ and with Christ. That's the teaching of the scripture. You're not your own. The old man has been crucified and all that belong to him, his sins, his lusts, his everything, they've all been dealt with. He's dead, buried with Christ, risen with Christ. Reckon yourselves, therefore, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, let me sum it up in this way, therefore. You and I, and to me this is one of the great discoveries in the Christian life, I shall never forget the release that realizing this for the first time brought to me. You and I must never look at our past lives, we must never look at any sin in our past life in such a way except it should lead us to praise God and to magnify his grace as Paul did. I challenge you with that. If you look at your past or anything in your past and are depressed by it, you're failing miserably as a Christian. That doesn't mean that I say you should look at your past and say nothing. No, no, you must do it as Paul did. I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But does he stop at that? Does he sit in his corner and say, I'm unworthy to be a preacher of the gospel? No, he says the exact opposite. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. 
When Paul looks at that past, he doesn't sit down in a corner and say, I'm unfit to preach, I'm not worthy to be a Christian. Alas, alack, I'm such a vile man, I've done such terrible things. Not at all. What he does to Paul is to make him praise God. He magnifies the grace. Listen, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the way to look at your past. So if you look at your past and are just depressed, it means you're listening to the devil. But if you look at that past and say, yes, unfortunately it was true. I was blinded by the God of this world. I did it in ignorance and unbelief. But thank God his grace was more abundant and abounding. It was more than sufficient. And his love and mercy came upon me in such a way. It's all forgiven and I'm a new man. Then it's all right. That's the way I say to look at the past, and if we don't do that, I'm almost tempted to say that we deserve to be miserable. Why believe the devil instead of believing God? Rise up out of it, my friend, and realize the truth about yourself as in Christ and one with him, and that all the past, whatever it may be, has gone and has been blotted out once and forever. Let us remember that it is sin to doubt God's word. It is sin to allow the past which God has dealt with to rob us of our joy and our usefulness in the present and in the future. I end with the words uttered from heaven to the doubtful, hesitant Apostle Peter. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou Rejoice in this wondrous grace and mercy that has blotted out your sin and made you a child of God. Amen.